This is King World News. I'm Eric King, and you're about to hear an incredibly important interview with Lord Christopher Monckton, former advisor to Margaret Thatcher. Lord Monckton's speech in the United States on the Copenhagen Treaty has become famous, and you will hear a brief clip of that speech just before the interview. Remember to go to our homepage at www.kingworldnews.com for more interviews, where this week we also have an absolutely riveting interview with Nigel Farage, national spokesman for the UK Independence Party, who gives listeners a glimpse into our future. We also have Dr. Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom Boom Doom newsletter, as well as Jeffrey Sout, chief investment strategist from Raymond James. As a bonus interview, we will have Congressman Ron Paul and his son, the future senator of Kentucky, Dr. Rand Paul, interviewed together, and that will be released on the site by late Saturday or Sunday. Before we get going in this interview with Lord Christopher Monckton, I'd like to play a roughly four-minute clip from his speech in the United States on the Copenhagen Treaty, which has become quite famous. And what are we doing instead? At Copenhagen, this December... Weeks away, a treaty will be signed. Your president will sign it. Most of the third world countries will sign it because they think they're going to get money out of it. Most of the left-wing regimes around the world, like the European Union, will rubber stamp it. Virtually nobody won't sign it. I have read that treaty. And what it says is this. That a world government is going to be created. The word government actually appears as the first of three purposes of the new entity. The second purpose is the transfer of wealth from the countries of the West to third world countries in satisfaction of what is called coyly a climate debt because we've been burning CO2 and they haven't and we've been screwing up the climate. We haven't been screwing up the climate, but that's the line. And the third purpose of this new entity, this government is enforcement. How many of you think that the word election or democracy or vote or ballot occurs anywhere in the 200 pages of that treaty? Quite right, it doesn't appear once. So at last, the communists who piled out of the Berlin Wall and into the environmental movement and took over Greenpeace so that my friends who founded it left within a year because they'd captured it, Now the apotheosis is at hand. They are about to impose a communist world government on the world. You have a president who has very strong sympathies with that point of view. He's going to sign. He'll sign anything. He's a Nobel Peace Laureate. Of course he'll sign it. And the trouble is this. If that treaty is signed, your constitution says that it takes precedence over your constitution. And you can't resile from that treaty unless you get the agreement of all the other states' parties. And because you'll be the biggest paying country, they're not going to let you out. So, thank you, America. You were the beacon of freedom for the world. It is a privilege merely to stand on this soil of freedom while it is still free. But in the next few weeks, unless you stop it, your president will sign your freedom your democracy and your prosperity away forever and neither you nor any subsequent government you may elect will have any power whatsoever to take it back again. That is how serious it is. I have read the treaty, I have seen this stuff about government and climate debt and enforcement. They are going to do this to you whether you like it or no. But I think it is here, here in your great nation which I so love and I so admire. It is here that perhaps at this 11th hour, at the 59th minute and the 59th second, you will rise up and you will stop your president from signing that dreadful treaty, that purposeless treaty, for there is no problem with the climate, and even if there were, economically speaking, there's nothing we can do about it. So I end by saying to you the words that Winston Churchill addressed to your president in the darkest hour before the dawn of freedom in the Second World War. He quoted from your great poet Longfellow, Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of 
future years is hanging breathless on thy fate. Thank you. Joining us now is Lord Christopher Monckton, former advisor to Margaret Thatcher, and just joined the UK Independence Party yesterday and will be their national spokesman on climate change and cap and trade. Nigel Farage broke that on the air on King World News yesterday. Right away, Lord Monckton, the Climategate scandal involving the email, showing the trail of fraud. What were your thoughts when you saw the fraud that you already knew existed completely uncovered through these emails? First of all, Uh, You're quite right. I knew the fraud existed. But you're quite right. I mean, what you very perceptively pointed out there is that I've been following the names that appeared in these emails, talking to each other daily over the Internet over the last 10 years. I've been following them via the scientific papers and contributions to the UN's report that they've been making. And I have been identifying, if you like, two dozen bad scientists who, in my view, were deliberately bastardizing and falsifying science for the sake of whipping up a scare because it suited them politically and it also suited them financially. If if you're a scientist and you can get a good scare going, then you can say to the government, right, I want you to pay me lots and lots of money to make the scare go away, and that means the government pays them out and goes on paying them out for as long as the scare can be credibly maintained. And that's really what's been happening here. So when I saw the Climate Gate email, and I saw all the names, every single one of the people that I'd been watching, producing bogus science, forcing it into the peer-reviewed literature by bullying editors, suborning peer reviewers, telling editors who they wanted to peer review their papers so that their friends did it, keeping other people's papers out of the literature, and then this enormous raft of bending of evidence fictionalizing of evidence, making up data, creating data, inventing it, processing it in various inacceptable ways, losing it, concealing it, hiding it. And then when a Freedom of Information request came in from a credible scientist saying, we want to check what you're doing here, they began writing to each other, working out ways to destroy it so that they didn't have to give it to third parties. It doesn't get seedier than that. This was a worldwide conspiracy of a very small number of people, because, of course, we're not talking of thousands of scientists worldwide and thousands of politicians all in some grand Masonic conspiracy or communist or fascist conspiracy. What we're talking of is a tiny handful, a couple of dozen at most, I guess, of very bad but very well-placed and very well-connected scientists in all parts of the world, in leading meteorological institutions, NASA, NOAA, GIS, NCDC, University of East Anglia, Hadley Center, all these places, Penn State University, a lot of the big universities too. And those are the drivers of the scare, the manufacturers and drivers of the scare. And then you have a host of what Lenin used to call useful idiots, people who simply believe it because it is politically congenial and financially profitable. And those are the ones I think I almost have more contempt for than I do for these fraudsters who are now incidentally going to face criminal investigation for fraud because two separate professors, one from Canada and one from the United States, have both been in touch with me in the last week and they said, please would I help them to put together police cases that that can be put in front of the police superintendent at the East Anglia Constabulary in Norwich that is looking into all this so that these scientists around the world who have been misleading us all into what could have turned out to be world fascism or world communism, depending on which label you like to attach to it, these people who very nearly got away with it and may yet get away with it will be brought to book and locked up for a very, very, very long time. Let's talk about this that just came out from the UK Guardian. Quote, the agreement leaked to the Guardian is a departure from the Kyoto Protocols principles that rich nations, which have emitted the bulk of CO2, should take on firm and binding commitments to reduce greenhouse gases, while poorer nations were not compelled to act. The draft hands effective control of climate change finance to the World Bank, end quote. What were your thoughts when you saw that? Because a lot of people were up in arms and saying, wait a minute, now all these monies are going to be funneled to the World Bank and they're going to decide how they're spent? Is that right? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to congratulate The Guardian for having got hold of any of the negotiating texts 
uh, in this panjandrum here in Copenhagen. I've just come back from the documentation center at the conference place, and I tried to get the current negotiating text. Now, I've done this twice now. I did it two or three days ago, and exactly the same happened this time. They looked completely blank. That was their first thing. There's no such thing as a negotiating text. I said, look, there's a conference going on, and it's negotiating a, an agreement. And I know there's a negotiating text, and I want to see it. 